Welcome to our newest episode of the Lebanese Physicians uh, Podcast. And today our topic will be uh, related to a uh, startup in Lebanon, which is performing uh, genetic and genomic testing on people and is seeking to actually innovate and move genetic testing forward in the country. And our guest today is Dr. Kevin Saliba and Dr. Mohamed Ali Jardali, who all of you know uh, by this time. Uh, he's been a guest on multiple podcasts. So thank you, Dr. Saliba, for joining us. I'm just going to give a brief introduction about uh, Kevin. I can go a lot uh, about Kevin, but I'm going to try to summarize it for the sake of time. So Kevin actually uh, graduated from the Lebanese University and has uh, finished his general surgery diploma there. And uh, that was not enough for him. He, he was always interested in... Uh, innovations and innovative surgeries. And also he's been interested in medicine in, in low socioeconomic status countries and in trying to innovate and help promote medical practice in these countries. And he's published on that quite a bit so far. And he's currently doing his master's in genomics and health at the Lebanese University. Uh, and throughout all this, he has decided to uh, have a startup in Lebanon called Genes Arabia that we will be discussing uh, more about today. Uh, and he's also involved in multiple uh, local and international NGOs uh, and uh, uh, currently is involved in an NGO in Lebanon uh, that has performed uh, hundreds of cataract surgeries uh, for free in the country. Uh, so welcome, Kevin, and welcome, uh, Muhammad Ali. Thank you. Thank you, Khalil, for this introduction. Uh, and thank you, Muhammad uh, Ali. Uh, it's a pleasure and honor to be tonight with you on this podcast. And hopefully... It, it's going to be informative and, and uh, help a lot of people tonight. Yeah, and I'm excited to be back and we're excited uh, to have you. It's uh, cool to have someone staying in Lebanon for a change and someone who actually has a startup in healthcare. We don't have a lot of people like that. So it's good to give you this podcast as a platform to talk about your work. Thank you. It's my pleasure. So Kevin, how, how did you get involved in in genomics. In genomics, yeah, coming coming from a surgical surgical background and into genomics, this is more like a hard science rather than you know being practical. But actually, it's it's a personal story, uh, and I like to share with you. This goes back to 2019. You know, at that time, uh, my father had a dilated cardiomyopathy. It was something that affected all of, all of our family uh, severely. You know. And then I started to be curious. My grandfather died uh, early at a younger age. We didn't know why, sudden cardiac arrest. My father had dilated cardiomyopathy, so I was curious, you know. And uh, I went and I did my own profile, my own genetic profile. And uh, I, I learned a lot about this. And I said, you know what, this is, this is going to be one of the mission because prevention is very important. And the most important part of doing prevention on a medical level is to go into genomics. Is going to be the future. It's going to be something that would change uh, people's lives and change my life. And from there on, it's uh, it's one of my missions today. Very interesting journey. Thank you for sharing uh, your story with us. So I'm going to dive uh, right into it. And if you can tell us more about genomics versus genetic sequencing, just to hash out the terminology for the audience. Okay, so uh, so we all uh, all our cells are made of uh, of genetic uh, material. They they contain the same genetic information. We all our all genomes are written with the four letter, you know, the A, T, C, and G. So if we wanna take this and put it like like a book, okay. So we have the alphabet, the A, T, C, and G. The genes are like one page of the book, and the genome is the whole book. So uh, if, if we're doing genetic testing, we're seeing one page, we're seeing, we're seeing one small area that we're looking at. But if we look at the genomics, we're looking at the big picture. So uh, genomics is more like, if, if you want to put it into like something we see every day, it's like a mechanical watch. And all the parts, how they interact together, they're going to give you time. So if the one part, which is not doing right its right function is going to give wrong time and if one part of the genome is is not functioning well it's not regulating well it's not coding for a certain protein well there's going to be some disturbance but it's much more than that so the genome by itself it's like half of the function of the body how you interact this genome with your environment with what you eat with what you take with, uh, what you perform as sports uh, with what drug you take, this makes this whole interaction, the epigenetics, the environment, 
defines really what you are. It's not only your genetic profile or genomic profile that defines, but it how it interacts with the environment that defines how your health is going to be. So knowing your weakest point, knowing your weakest gene, and doing this interaction with the environment, with what you eat, with what supplement you take, this is going to make a big difference in your health. This is what's going to make you healthier, live uh, a healthier life, live longer, healthy life. And this is a pretty new technology, right? The human genome sequencing was only done in like 2003, I think. So this is like yes. relatively new technology. And now you're able yes. to do it relatively yes. fast and cheap. Yes, the first human genome took like 13 years, $5 billion uh, to make, you know. But now in, in like four weeks, a uh, couple of hundreds of dollars, you have this. And this is like life-changing technology, really. And uh, what made it available, it's, it's the performance of the, uh, the, the, the sequencer or what we call the next generation sequencer. So now we're at the third and it soon is going to be the fourth uh, generation of sequencer. And with this generation, you know, we're able to sequence a whole genome in like a few days. In a few days. So it sounds maybe... pretty cool. But what are the yes. clinical implications besides knowing your own gene, genome sequencing? Yes. So uh, the clinical implications are actually quite big, you know. There is a lot of prevention we can do uh, on the three levels of prevention, primary, secondary, and tertiary. So to put it on a primary level, which means we don't get to the point that we have a disease, so there is a lot that we can know. That's, uh, I'm going to give you an example. So let's say on a cardiovascular level, if you have like Brugada or long QT syndrome, which cause sudden cardiac arrest and sudden death. If you have this certain disease, it's very easier. You're gonna implant an ICD and you can have your life completely normal without the fear of like having a sudden cardiac arrest and die. Uh, also like if, if you have certain uh, predisposition to disease, say diabetes, say hypertension, say cancer, you're going to know exactly how to interact with your body, what to eat, what not to eat, what supplementation, what maybe uh, drugs you have to take to prevent. On the second level, on the secondary prevention level, uh, you know how, how focused you're going to be. So let's say uh, somebody has uh, breast cancer uh, genes uh, or uh, colon cancer, you know, let's start screening early on, you know, let's not wait till to the recommended age. Uh, let's be more focused on that. And on the tertiary level, you're going to know exactly, especially with pharmacogenomics, uh, which is the study that study how your body interacts with the drugs. Uh, so you're going to know exactly how to, to prevent secondary effect, which molecule is best for, for you. I'm going to give an example. So one of, of my patients, I know exactly which uh, anti-cholesterol to give, which statin to give, you know? So uh, in his profile, there is like atorvastatin, an X, uh, simvastatin, an X, rosivastatin, a green tick. So I start with rosivastatin because it is the best treatment for his condition. So on, on the cancer, you know, uh, with the cancer, you can know which type of chemotherapy it works best, which type of chemotherapy it has uh, resistance on. So you can prevent a lot of, uh, of secondary effects, and you can be very specific, very proactive, and very preventive with genomics. So it has a lot to do with prevention. The, the, the basic pillar of genomics is prevention. So, so my, my next question for you is, yeah, prevention is important, but when patients or people come to you to do the testing, yes. do you talk to them about the pros and cons of doing the testing, such as like if you if you are found to be predisposed, let's say, to Huntington's disease or uh, or other diseases that could, let's say, cause blindness or, or uh, other implications, uh, people may get anxious from that. So are people ready for this? If, if that is to happen. Yes, this is an important, very important question. Actually, uh, before doing the test, we do uh, a long uh, uh, history taking an interview with the patient to, to assess really the patient. And sometimes if we, uh, we, if we assess somebody that is not ready, we ask our in-house psychologist to have uh, a meeting with him 
to assess further, you know, to make sure he's ready. Then we ask uh, every patient that his consent to 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 let him, to to ask him what would like to know, you know. Uh, is there like a certain family history, something like you, you're really uh, interested to know or just general knowledge, you'd like to know everything, you'd like to know something that, that you can make uh, a step about it. And of course, if, if we see that there is something uh, uh, that, that may be uh, emergent or, or, or life emergency, usually we tend uh, to, to, to tell them. Uh, so it's very important to assess them on this level, and we we do we do an approach. So it's, if if you have certain means, this is a predisposition. It's not a death note, you know. Uh, so there is something we can do, and if there is something we can do right now, maybe with the future uh, studies that we're going, basically there be something we can do. There there is something we can prevent. Uh, but at least he has the knowledge, so it's not like a surprise. Especially if he if he likes to know. So uh, fortunately, we didn't have anybody who's Huntington disease so far. This is something <laughs> would be quite challenging for us. But uh, most of the predisposition that we talk about, usually there is steps we can do to reduce the risk. Uh, steps to push further the disease. You know, like have like let let's say the diabetes instead of having it at 40, let's have it at 50, 60, or 70. You know, we're going to prevent a lot of disabilities. We're going to have better life uh, uh, quality. So, so this, this is what, what we focus on. So talking about prevention, this is like music to my ear. This is like my bread and butter as family physicians. So I'm glad to hear that there's an extra tool that we can use. So it's good to hear that you sit down with the patient before the results. But do you also sit down with them when the results come back? Do you offer like genetic counseling as part of your service? Yes, of course, of course. Uh, our, our, uh, yeah, there is, uh, there is like, uh, there is a lot of gene testing direct to consumer nowadays that uh, you just send it by, uh, by mail and you receive it by email. You're gonna receive your results. But the core of this is is the healthcare professional, you know, because if you read like 400 pages of of genomics. Uh, you're gonna be oh wow this is so overwhelming where do I start? But if uh, if you have somebody who's trained who have uh, spent time who has the knowledge who know what to tell you and where to guide you uh, and how to guide you through it, it's it's gonna be much different. But it's gonna be a pleasant uh, journey, you know, a, a journey of prevention. So of course our core service is 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 not just only doing the service. It's it's what comes after the follow up. So uh, what we provide our, our client with is one month, six months, and one year follow-up included in, in every sequencing. And, that, and after that, it's just for him either to follow up with us or with his primary care physician or any physician who would like. So uh, what we also have done is we have created a network of healthcare professionals, each in his, uh, uh, in his uh, uh, specialty, you know, in order to give further uh, information or further prevention. So if let's say I have a certain uh, tumor predisposition, so it's going to go to our oncologist. Uh, let's say he wants to have, uh, sometimes we have a certain athletes, so they want somebody who specializes in nutrition and sports. So we're going to uh, send them there and so on and so on. So uh, to each a category of disease to each system of disease or predisposition, we have a certain specialist that our uh, clients or customers or patient could follow up with. I have two, two questions for you, actually. One is, uh, are, are people in Lebanon accepting? Uh, how did they accept or how are they taking uh, this genomic testing? Like, do they, uh, do they find it uh, socially acceptable? Uh, are they uh, open to... To getting it done because it could have clinical implications or implications on their families uh, too and the second part of the question is uh, medical insurance in lebanon especially these days has been pretty challenging and uh, they always deny let's say insurance coverage for pre-existing conditions so if you are found to have yeah. a pre-existing uh, propensity to develop a certain disease will they deny you medical insurance in that case okay Actually, great, great questions. So, uh, answering your first question, 
So answering your first question, actually, we see a lot of openness, you know. Uh, most of our clients or patients are usually uh, open to the, they want to they wanna have a good quality of life, they want to have prevention. Uh, the way we approach the subjects also, like, uh, give them, make them more comfortable uh, and, and being at ease with anything that may come up. And it's always up to them to 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 what extent they want to know. So so we always have their consent. So uh, so this is for for the first part of the question. For the second part of the question, and due to the lack of legislation to to these conditions, we have added several layers of uh, of data privacy to that. So from the anonymity of uh, uh, the test, so. It's only a serial number, you're gonna go with a serial number, you only have access to it and your doctor. It doesn't link to your uh, personal data, uh, neither your name, neither DOB, nothing of your privacy data is, is, on the, is linked to, to these tests. Uh, also, you're in control of your genomic data, so you can uh, delete it from our database at any time you'd like. Uh, you can have it on a, on a flash drive whenever you want it, so you can download, keep it in a safe place. Uh, and of course, it's J, uh, JDPR, which is the highest form of privacy uh, uh, to, of data privacy compliance. So uh, all the data is safe with us. We don't uh, we don't provide or sell any data, uh, and it's always anonymous, of course. So maybe this is one of the good things about having a fragmented. Healthcare system in Lebanon is that you don't share the data with the insurance. So maybe something good came out of our situation. No, it's not only that, it's, it's worldwide. So even if, if you are in uh, any Arab country or any European country, your data, you are in control of your data. So we, we make sure that this data is very private. Uh, nobody has access to it and it doesn't link to your private data. Okay. So I wanted to ask you the questions on the business side. Uh, there's like a ton of challenges starting a business right yes. now in Lebanon. So do you yes. want to share maybe more about your experience operating in the current uh, climate? Uh, you know, like for every crisis, there is new opportunities. Maybe uh, I'm going to start with the opportunities. You know, uh, I like to see things from positive side of, of the spectrum. Uh, so, so maybe this is the right time for us to start because uh, the big names, the big competition, uh, the big companies are really downsizing, closing. So there is a market, there is people who need this. It's not any uh, part of what we do is prevention, but part of uh, a big part of or big chunk of what we do is, all, is also diagnostics. So people who need this, people who are in need of genetic testing and genomic testing, uh, people who have cancer and need to know which type of uh, uh, therapies, target therapies they need to, to do. People who have unknown uh, syndromes and they need their kids or they need to be diagnosed. So this is one big chunk of, uh, of our part of what we do. And we provide diagnostic, we provide something very essential for people to, to recover. Uh, so... And today, what we have done, we, we calibrated the market, we made our profits, we, our margins very small just to sustain the business. But the most important thing is to provide the service to the Lebanese citizens and to the Lebanese population. It's very important for us. This is a very technological tool, which is important nowadays. Uh, we cannot skip it. We cannot be like in the 70s uh, anymore. We need to be uh, to have the best therapies for us, and we need to have these diagnostics. So part of our responsibility is to provide these tests to the Lebanese population, to, to the Lebanese citizen. And it was an opportunity. So we're doing this, we're providing the service, we're a startup, and, and it's doing well, you know, uh, even with all the challenges, even because uh, it's all paid in, in fresh currency, because our lab is in Italy. So we cannot make uh, one big lab in Lebanon like like the one we have in Italy. Uh, it it wouldn't make sense. Uh, and it, if if you're gonna price a test, it's gonna be like 10, 15, 20 times costier than than what what it is. Because uh, to run such a facility, you ha it it's, it has a huge operation. 
and because our lab work all over the world, so this makes more the, uh, more affordable for people to do it. So basically what happens is you draw or the blood or the samples are drawn in Lebanon, but then they're sent <laughs> to Italy to be run over there, right? Yes. Uh, so you, so basically the lab is operated by, so you, you were able to sign an understanding or an agreement with the lab in Italy to run these samples for the patients, right? Yes, actually, uh, actually we started uh, in two countries. We started in Lebanon and we have operation in Jordan's. Uh, and what, what we're looking for is to expand also uh, in the, the GCC. We consider Lebanon as, as, uh, as our prime market. It's always, uh, it always the work it to start with, uh, to, to, to provide the service. And also on a business level, it's also a market to, to, to learn and interact with because unfortunately, but there is, uh, there is, there is a quite margin for, for learning. You know, so you can learn a lot, you can interact a lot. There is a lot of uh, competition here, but also at the same time, uh, there is a lot of flexibility. So uh, you get to learn, you get to understand. It's always a hub for all the startups of the Lebanese. And if you can make it to Lebanon, you can make it anywhere in the world, you know, with all these uh, challenges that we have, with all that uh, step backs that you have. So if you can make it here, I think you can make it anywhere. So basically, was it? So what, I think the judge's yeah. question was: Was it easy to start the business? Like how? Because you have to go through a lot of bureaucratic red tape, right? To to get to start the business and move it forward. Yes, there is a little bit of hard work, especially. Well, that's bad for our lawyer. She has to take care of all that. <laughs> but uh, on, on the bright side, it's it's. You know, it's it's all about your drive. It's all about your ambition. It's all about your ability. It's all about uh, how how hard you want to make it. You know, if if you want to succeed, you can succeed. This this is something very essential. Second thing is always to uh, to to get your team, to have a good team, to be surrounded by a good team, to have a good strategist, uh, good uh, business developers. Uh, good uh, prospectors, and you have to reach out to every person you know. You know, if uh, so, one part. So, if if we say, let's say, we're segmenting our our customer, we don't only reach to pediatric neurologists, oncologists, cardiovascular cardiologists. We reach to everybody. You know, everybody uh, can give you like uh, a piece of information you didn't know about. Uh, every person you talk to will give you like a new horizon you didn't know about, you didn't think about. So uh, reach to everybody, tell your idea to everybody, uh, and 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 it works. I like the positivity. <laughs> I like uh, the attitude, uh, and I hope it gets you far. I I wanted to ask you like how big is your scale of operations right now? How many patients are you able to reach, and what's like your target? Okay, so uh, so basically now uh, we're expanding because of uh, uh, two university hospitals. So uh, we're going to be providing them with uh, with all their genomics and genetic uh, services. Uh, this is one part to our uh, you know business model and uh, logistics facilities that we provide. So. Uh, so we provide a lot of uh, facilities, especially logistic-wise, shipping, uh, handling is one part of, of what we do. Second is uh, the genetic counseling services. So uh, a lot of uh, doctors and a lot of hospitals, they have one big problem, which, okay, with the uh, sequencing, with the genetic study, but who's there for us to read it? Uh, today we were in a visit for one of the doctors and told me, okay, we did this uh, whole genome like uh, two years ago and till the day we don't have an answer. So I told them, just send us uh, this and in like one week we're going to give you the result. So you're going to know exactly what was it. Uh, so this part of, of the service is, is, is what usually make people do business with us, you know. Providing the service, providing the reporting, providing uh, the expertise to read such genetic information and such genomic information. That's good to hear. And uh, did you want to share a little bit about uh, your corporate social responsibility? We were talking about it before we filmed this. 
Yes, of course. So also one part of, of what we're doing, we're approached by one of the governmental hospitals and one of the NGOs that take care of a lot of uh, neonatal patients, patient, uh, basically uh, new uh, newborns, uh, kids who are uh, left. So they take care medically of them before sending them to another uh, NGOs or, or facilities that take care of them. And most of the time, these these kids, unfortunately, have like severe syndromes. Uh, we don't know what they have. They have certain disease. We're unsure of what it is. And the parents are usually not there because they are left out. Uh, so we don't have like a family history. Uh, so part of our uh, corporate social responsibility today is, is uh, to try and uh, provide these services for them from uh, different NGOs or private donors. So currently we're making a fund for it that's going to be run by this NGO to provide these, these patients, these, these, these infants, uh, let's say, with the, with the needed genetic testing in order to diagnose them well, to treat them well, to give them a better chance of survival. Any success stories you can tell us about? Uh, yes, actually, there is like quite a few success stories, and there is one which is, uh, unfortunately, it, it is a sad story, but it, it, it gave us closure. Uh, so I'm going to share two stories with you. One, one of them, the first one, it, it is a real success story. So uh, one of, of our uh, patients came to us with like, uh, she always like has disturbances, abdominal pain, cramps. And everybody was telling her, yes, stop eating this, stop doing that. Maybe this is IBS, etc." So she came to us with this, these vague symptoms. Uh, and then we, we did our, uh, our genomic test. And on the genomic test, we had like uh, several ticks, especially on the colon crone, on colitis. There was like few, two other ticks uh, I don't recall the exact uh, uh, the exact disease, but I told her, you know what, we cannot make this one. She was like 40 year old, so I told her it's not, it's not gonna be that easy. We need to do a colonoscopy. Told me no. My doctor told me at 50 there is no need. I told her no. We need to do it right now. And then uh, she did her uh, her colonoscopy, and fortunately enough, we found like a small patch of ulcerative colitis. Uh, that started very early on. Usually they start at a later age, but in her case, it started early. It was just a small patch. We discovered it. We started on uh, her on, on the treatment, and now she feels much, much better. So instead of progressing and then getting to a point where there was the bleeding, cancer risk, uh, et cetera, all the complication, now she's, she's going to have a better life. She's going to avoid maybe having a colectomy one day. So this is one of, of our success story. The other one, uh, unfortunately, it's a sad story. So uh, our, our geneticists uh, in Jordan, uh, they all had COVID. She, her mother, her father, it was a walk in the park. It was very easy. It was like just a simple flu. So uh, taking that, her brother uh, thought, OK, we have good genes. COVID is easy on us. And then he got COVID. And unfortunately, he went through one hectic pathway for the COVID in ICU, ECMO. Uh, he didn't come out, and unfortunately, he died. So fortunately enough, we took a, a sample, uh, and we sent it for sequencing. And uh, we found out that he had two conditions that made it very tough to survive. Given his 35-year-old, his uh, very... Uh, a very good built man. Uh, so the two conditions were cystic fibrosis and factor five laden. Wow. So being 35 year old and cystic fibrosis doesn't make sense, you know, but unfortunately it was an underlying condition. Having factor five laden made sense of why he had the IC, coagulation. Cystic fibrosis made sense why his lung wouldn't pick up, etc. So it gives the family closure, it gave us closure why this happened. Uh, but for, unfortunately, if we knew beforehand, maybe it would have been a different approach to treatment. It would be a different approach to prevention. And uh, it would made, uh, it would, it would give him a chance, unfortunately. 
thank you for sharing uh, those stories with us. And I really enjoyed our talk. Uh, it's good to see someone uh, at the forefront of medical innovation and disruption in the healthcare sector in Lebanon. And I'm really impressed uh, with your determination to focus at prevention at the core of your business. I really resonate with that, your message. Uh, are there any final words you want to conclude this talk today? First, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to talk more about prevention, to spread this awareness. Uh, second, uh, my, uh, I'd, I'd like to, uh, to invite uh, all the healthcare to take a look of, on, on, on the genomics, take a look on, uh, on this new science, if you'd like, and patients alike and customers alike, everybody to, to just be open to the idea, to get to know more, see if you have any risk factor in your family, go and do the test because there is a lot that we can do. There's a lot of prevention we can do. And it could save your life one day. And thank you, uh, Kevin. Thank you, Hamad Ali, for being on this podcast. And uh, especially thank you, Kevin. I mean, this is this is a a positive story in a uh, in a dark era in Lebanon right now. But uh, but hopefully, a lot more people will be doing things uh, like you and starting startup startups in the country that will uh, create jobs and uh, and move the market forward. Yes, hopefully.